The governments and people of the United Kingdom and the United States have been friends for much longer than they were enemies. However, diplomatic relations between the two countries haven't always been smooth sailing. Literally. One such time was during the American Civil War. Today, we'll explore a Civil War story involving the Queen of Great Britain. On November 12, 1861, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom, Charles Francis Adams, received a private note from Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister. This was way out of protocol, since the U.S. Ambassador usually met with the British Foreign Secretary to discuss intergovernmental affairs. But the Prime Minister wanted a private meeting. That night, at Lord Palmerston's office in 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister got to business. He informed Adams that he had received a report that an American captain got gloriously drunk on brandy, his words, not mine, and was overheard bragging that he was going to arrest a group of Confederate diplomats. Lord Palmerston was cordial and didn't comment on whether the arrest would be legal or not, but he warned Adams that such action would, quote, not lead to any good, unquote. Little did either of them know that another Federal Navy captain had already arrested two Confederate diplomats just two days earlier. This was Captain Charles Wilkes of the USS San Jacinto, who arrested rebel diplomats James Murray Mason and John Slidell. To do this, he stopped and boarded the British mail steamer Trent off the coast of Spanish Cuba. The Trent affair caused a diplomatic incident straining relations between the two countries. This was especially bad for the US because the worst case scenario for the Union cause would have been for Britain to recognize and openly aid the Confederacy. Resulting from the incident, three months later in February 1862, the British government issued a proclamation declaring neutrality in the American Civil War and passed the Neutrality Act. They specifically recognized a state of hostilities between the US government and the states calling themselves the Confederate States of America. In this way, the UK recognized the CSA as a belligerent faction, but not as a sovereign nation. It was a mixed blessing for both the North and South. The implications of British neutrality were that both the USA and CSA could have their diplomats and civilian merchants in British territories, but the proclamation made in the name of the Queen expressly forbade any British facilities, public or private, from being used to aid in either faction's war effort under the Foreign Enlistment Act. The Neutrality Act also prohibited American military vessels, federal and rebel, from entering the ports of Nassau or the Bahamas except in emergency circumstances or by the express leave of the royal governor. The following year, there was another incident involving the two countries, and this one briefly even involved the Queen. Although Britain had declared neutrality, many government officials spent the first two years of the war looking the other way, while the Confederacy sought to supply its war effort on the British economy. In some cases, British officials even aided the Confederacy. For example, the British consulate in Havana issued phony British merchant credentials to the blockade runner CSS Arizona. The Confederacy simply did not have enough infrastructure to meet its demand for warships and blockade runners, so the Confederate government and southern-based ship manufacturers heavily depended on shipyards in the UK. Late in 1862, Thomas Dudley, the U.S. Consul in Liverpool, believed he had accurate intel on at least one ship being built in Liverpool for the Confederate Navy. This ship was the Alexandra, a 300-ton steamer named after the new Princess of Wales by marriage to the Prince, and was intended for blockade running for the Confederacy. The British firm Fawcett, Preston & Company got the contract for the deliverable, and then they subcontracted the actual building of the ship to W.C. Miller & Son, who had already built the CSS Alabama. This wasn't unique. It was an open secret that the American Civil War was a boon for British ship manufacturing, but it was the first time a US official had enough hard evidence to press the issue. Ambassador Adams petitioned the British Foreign Secretary to enforce the Neutrality Act. However, the law was clear in what it prohibited, but vague in how neutrality should be enforced. Therefore, the British government prosecuted the matter under the Foreign Enlistment Act, which was cited as an authority in the Neutrality Act. The Prime Minister himself ordered the ship seized, and on April 5, 1863, the Surveyor of Customs at Liverpool had the ship seized and marked on the mast with the King's Broad Arrow. Twelve people, including William Miller of Miller & Son and H.B. Preston of Fawcett, Preston & Company, were charged with 96 counts of violating the Foreign Enlistment Act, quote, without leave or license of Her Majesty, unquote. This being Queen Victoria. 
This made ship manufacturers with military contracts across the UK pause construction since few were willing to risk prosecution. In response to the charges, the defendants filed a petition for a defense attorney, which had to be appointed by the Crown. They specifically wanted the services of Sir George Mellish, a well-known English barrister and judge of the Court of Appeals of Chancery. On June 2nd, Queen Victoria responded that the petitioners are desirous of retaining the assistance of George Mellish Esquire, one of our council, and therefore humbly pray that we will be pleased to grant to the petitioners our royal license accordingly. We being graciously pleased to condescend to the petitioner's request and accordingly dispense with the said George Mellish and grant him our royal license and permission to be counsel. The trial began on June 22nd and the defendants won as the Crown's prosecutor was unable to prove definitively that the ship was to be used for military purposes. However, the prosecution filed an appeal with the House of Lords and that stage of the legal process took another year to play out. During that time, the Alexandra was still held in seizure. The defendants beat the appeal as well, and the royal government had to release the ship. The defendants sued for damages and were granted £3,700. The ship was sold and renamed Mary. Although the defendants had made a convincing case in court that they were civilian merchants and the ship was intended for civilian commerce, the ship was always intended for blockade running, and that's exactly what it was used for when it was sold in 1864. During the several months of blockade running, the Alexandra is known to have anchored at Nova Scotia, Bermuda, Nassau, and the Bahamas in violation of the Neutrality Act. The ship was seized again by British authorities in the Bahamas in December of 1864, and it remained in seizure for the rest of the war. Some of you might be asking, what does this story have to do with the Wild West? Well, um, Latinos, and by the logic of Shanghai Nights, which is the sequel to Shanghai Noon, this story is also somehow a western. Anyway, the UK's proclamation of neutrality had been issued not by the Queen, but in her name by the Duke of Newcastle, and that document bore his signature. The 1863 document appointing the Defense Council for Preston Miller and the other defendants is the only document relating to the American Civil War that was signed by the hand of Queen Victoria. While the British government had quite a bit to do with the Civil War, this is the one direct connection between that war and the Queen of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. I can't say exactly how excited that last group was about that association, but she had the job title. Since we're talking about Queen Victoria, who was queen for over half a century, here are some fun facts about the top five longest reigning British monarchs. Number five is Edward III of England, who was crowned at nine years old and ruled for 56 years during the 13th century. Number four is James VI of Scotland, who later became James I of England. He's the king who commissioned the English language translation of the authorized version of the Bible, which we call the King James Bible. Four centuries later, it's still the most read English language translation of the Bible. He's also the king who wrote Demonology, and partly inspired the madness of the English Witchfinder General and later the North American Witch Trials, but that's another story for another day. At 57 and a half years on British thrones, James was the King of Scotland twice as long as he was King of England, but since the two countries are under one kingdom today, his Scotland credentials are recognized in London. Number three is George III of Great Britain, at 59 years and 96 days on the throne. Yes, that George III. Without a doubt, his mark on American history is indisputable. Number two, with a reign of 63 and a half years and some change, is Queen Victoria of Great Britain, the star of the story you just heard. Because the British Empire had conquered India and divided it into the Raj and into the many kingdoms of the princely states, Victoria was also the Empress of India. I'm not sure how the folks of Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh feel about that, but she had the job title. And number one on the list is Queen Elizabeth II, with the reign of 70 years and 214 days. She was crowned in 1952 at the age of 25, and she passed away on September 8, 2022, at the age of 96. As princess, she served in the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the women's branch of the British Army, at age 18, and worked as a truck mechanic during World War II. During her reign as queen, 
the British Empire underwent a historic period of decolonization. The Berlin Wall went up and came down. The Soviet Union collapsed. The UK won the Falklands War. The rebels broke South African apartheid. The provisional IRA disarmed after the Good Friday Agreement. Various Commonwealth countries voted to become republics. And the UK offered refuge to millions of Hong Kongers facing the tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party. Being an American, I don't celebrate monarchies, but I do recognize that this monarch and the hundreds of millions of British subjects around the world alive during her time in office have not been enemies to my country. They've been friends.